Thank you for joining us today for MA's weekly webcast. This week, our webcast is entitled Using Art to Love Your Neighbor, and it is presented by the Harrison Center. I would like to introduce to you um, Joanna Taft, who serves as the founding executive director of the Harrison Center, uh, which is an artist studio center in Indianapolis which has shared a building with Redeemer Presbyterian Church for over 20 years. The Harrison Center is a national leader in grassroots cultural development and neighborhood creative placing. For these endeavors, she has received the Governor's, Award, Governor's Arts Award, Hoosier Heritage Lifetime Achievement Award, the Indianapolis Business Journal Woman of Influence Award, the Girls Incorporated Touchstone Award, Arts Council of Indianapolis, Arts Council of Indianapolis ARTI Award, Jefferson Award, and two Cultural Vision Awards. She's a graduate of College of Covenant College and the Stanley K. Lacey class of 32 and was a 2012 Creative Renewal Fellow. I think most of all, uh, Joanna would like you to know that she is a child of the King. She loves the Lord and she loves the way that he uses her in this very creative and distinct way of loving her neighbors. Joanne, I am going to turn the program over to you and allow you to introduce Ms. Shirley. And we are excited to learn more about how to love our neighbors using art. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tracy, for having us. So yeah, I'm Joanna Taft and I'm here with Miss Shirley, one of my neighbors. And um, Miss Shirley and I are gonna talk to you today about how we have seen um, the role of art impacting our community and uh, things we've learned and things we wanna share. So I'm gonna start by sharing my screen and I'm gonna lead the conversation and then Miss Shirley is gonna have a chance to follow up. So I'm gonna share. And so um, I have been, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. It says that my speaker's not working, but if you can hear me, that's great. Um, so I am, the executive director of the Harrison Center, and we share a building with Redeemer Presbyterian Church, and we've been together for 20 years now. I have a little video I'm gonna play that talks about kind of the benefits of sharing this building. Churches come in all different shapes and sizes, and the buildings they meet in do too. From traditional church buildings, to commercial strip malls, to old schools, each church has their own personality. However, Many only utilize their space one day a week. What kind of impact could churches have if they became hubs for the community the other six days of the week? What could it look like if they shared their space creatively, convertibly? The Harrison Center is an art gallery in downtown Indianapolis that shares its space with Redeemer Presbyterian Church. The same sanctuary utilized for Sunday morning services is a place for the community to gather, create connections, and wrestle with ideas that matter. The art gallery is open business hours during the week, used for coffee and donuts in between Sunday services, and becomes an evening event space and pop-up restaurant for local chefs. The Fellowship Hall hosts lunches on Sundays and converts into a performance space for the community choir. The gym hosts craft fairs and basketball. The roof turns into a cafe. The sculpture garden welcomes Sunday school kids and dog walkers alike. The Harrison Center is striving to reach the community. Redeemer is striving to reach the community. By working together, churches can partner with other organizations to share their space creatively and convert their buildings into not just places of worship, but centers for the community. So we do share this building and it's kind of a crazy building. In our building are 36 artists that have studios here. So these studios are very different. Um, they're in the basement, they're in the attic. This is the old pipe room from where the pipe work and pipes used to be right next to the sanctuary. 
And so we have artists, but we also have galleries. We have seven galleries that change art monthly. And then we have lots of other miscellaneous venues. We have a gym where we have high school basketball, a dance class, as well as um, light installations and community events. So when we started in 2000 or 20 years ago, um, really quite quickly, we had a lot of success. We had over a thousand people coming to First Friday events and people were talking about our impact in the community. So you can imagine I was feeling a little pretty good, right? But after about two years, um, my artists started coming to me and saying, Joanna, I need to move. I need to leave Indianapolis. Um, and I'm, I said, what are you talking about? We have you know, great events here. And they said, Joanna, we need to move to cities where there are art patrons, where people actually love and support the arts. I can't make a living here. I can't pay my bills. So that was really shocking for me to hear. And I didn't really know what to do. But about the same time, there was a um, college campus around the corner. It was an art college that had been the original site for the Indianapolis Museum of Art. And the college announced that it was actually moving to the other part, to the west side of town after having had that campus there for over hundred years. So this was a huge crisis for our community to have vacant buildings. Vacant buildings are never good for, for neighborhoods. And so I started going to meetings, community meetings and finding about, out about the situation. And I finally had a crazy idea and I, I raised my hand and said, what would happen if we start a high school designed to grow art patrons or these well-rounded citizens that would grow up to become our moms and our doctors and our artists and our teachers and our voters, voters and, and our church members and our community um, volunteers. And so um, the crazy story is we were actually able to start a high school. So the building on the right is the first high school we started, which was Heron High School. And then the, that high school turned into a network of schools called Indianapolis Classical Schools with Riverside High School opening in 2017 and a third campus an elementary school um, opening this fall. So when we started the high school, all of a sudden we had kids, we had teenagers that really wanted to be involved in, in something. They wanted, they had passion and they had um, zest for life and they wanted to do neighborhood work. And so we started an internship program. Um, our interns do everything from run our music festival. We have an annual music festival that has anywhere from eight to 10,000 people. And that has been run by a 16 year old uh, for at least 11 of, of uh, 18 years. Um, sometimes it gets them running this festival will get them scholarships to Spelman, it's happened, have, have gotten them um, all kinds of other opportunities uh, for the resume to help them get into school and to um, get the right, get on the right path. Other interns have done things like repairing broken buildings with Legos. Or one winter when we had snow for three months straight and it didn't melt and we were tired of that white and gray, our interns painted the snow and um, they brought some color into, into commuters' lives as they're, as they're driving home every day. Another crazy thing our interns did, um, they like to do creative placemaking and unusual ways they say to bless people. So one summer it was very hot. And so they made a pool truck and they drove, they decided to drive around the city blessing people. Do you like how they use this language? They're gonna bless people just by making their hearts happy. So they pulled off and they, they started driving down the road and within five minutes, they were pulled over by the police officer and they were told never to do that again. <laughs> so um, they still were really happy that they had a few minutes to make some people really happy. And after that, we didn't do any pool trucks. Instead, we moved to the pool garden or the truck gardens. And this in turn um, drilled holes in her dad's flat bed or back of his uh, truck, filled it with dirt and planted um, plants in it. And then they started going to the apartment complexes and letting the little kids dig in the dirt and taste the garden or taste the, the vegetables and the herbs as they were growing. And uh, this kind of art is actually called, there's a name for it, it's called relational art. And the intern learned that in relational art, what you're, you're doing it to um, evoke a community response. And it's usually a philanthropic or a good response. In this case, while the community loved it, her father's response, he wasn't very happy about the holes drilled in his truck, but um, it was still a great learning project for all of us. 
So again, with creative placemaking, um, interns had all kinds of ideas. And one of my interns came to me and he said, I wanna build giant puppets, but I don't have enough money to do it. I need $372. And so we actually had a little fund that we created so that our interns could apply for small amounts of money um, to buy materials for their projects. And um, I looked at him and I said, how am I supposed to tell my funders that I'm giving you $372? That's a lot of money to build puppets. What community need are you addressing? And without skipping a beat, he looked at me and he said, Indianapolis needs a spectacle of wonder. And that got me, that was amazing. And so he built these puppets and the puppets, um, they were very difficult to um, operate. The one on the left is a bird of paradise. It's 12 feet tall, had an 18 foot wingspan. And it actually um, was made with two by fours. And so it was very hard to operate, back breaking literally. Um, but he set them up in the middle of the of downtown and people started streaming out of their office buildings and, and then TV came and the newspaper came and there was a lot of earned media, which is really great. But the best thing that happened was it made people really happy they lived in Indianapolis. Indianapolis needs a spectacle, spectacle of wonder. How can you be a spectacle of wonder in your neighbor's lives? How can you bring a spectacle of wonder to your community? Other interns, we have an ideas competition and one intern won a citywide ideas competition and did the very first um, Indianapolis adult coloring book. Uh, and that was a way for people to get to know and love their community. Well, in 2008, something else happened. Somebody sent me this map, and this is actually not a painting. This is a map, and it's an abandoned housing map of Indianapolis. And uh, I looked at this map, and I, I realized that every dot on this map represented an abandoned building, but it also represented so much more. It represented a social justice issue. It represented an education issue, a public safety issue. Every abandoned house has an effect, a multiplying effect on a community. And so I knew that the arts had been very helpful in helping strengthen education, but I was curious if the arts could help strengthen neighborhoods. And so after thinking about it, I realized that we had our own abandoned um, storefront on the south end of our building. We had a, an abandoned section. And so we decided to open it up and to um, create a new space called the City Gallery. And the City Gallery is a gallery whose purpose was to show place-based art. And this is art that celebrates place and tells stories of place. Um, but we also provided a concierge. And for five years, the concierge's job was to connect people to culture, community, and place. And so in some sense, in some cases, she was helping people find housing. In other cases, she was uh, helping them learn about their neighborhood association or get invited to a porch party or um, get information on, on um, how to get their sidewalk fixed or, or any other community issue. When we started doing this place-based work, all of a sudden, um, art just seemed to leave the four walls of our building and started popping up. We started using billboards as frames for art. Um, this is actually a billboard painting of my front porch. And in it, I'm wearing the long black dress and I look taller and skinnier. I love what artists can do. Artists can reimagine everything. And so I love that painting. Um, we started working in neighborhoods that were not our own neighborhood. And I'm gonna show you um, a video of an artist's idea of how to bring two groups of neighbors that had nothing in common, different races, different socioeconomic groups. And um, his idea was, what if we were to create a record of, of lighting the most um, uh, sparklers at one time? And what if what happens from that is we create a memory together, a shared experience that will help us build relationships. So I'm gonna show that video.
So that, that project was called 38th and Shine. And we didn't set a world record, but we did set the Indiana record. And so um, this two groups of neighbors um, began with making a memory together and have been working together um, ever since. Um, in that same neighborhood, we started doing pop-up um, events, more puppets. Uh, we used shipping containers and built fake storefronts, uh, did uh, gallery openings and coffee shops, uh, that type of thing. Um, we had free flower Fridays. That was probably the, everyone's favorite. Uh, and I wish we could still be doing that. Um, our artists started going out into the neighborhood and making art in front of neighbors. Um, that, this is when we really started getting into music. We started writing songs. We've do, been doing a lot of visual art, but we started commissioning songs, um, celebrating place. And um, later on, we added a podcast um, about using some of those songs that we had written. And I'm gonna add one more thing, a hip operetta. So I'm gonna show you the hip operetta. I was born at the end of May in Wisconsin late one day, growing strong and proud and keen the goal of this project is to provide something tangible that directly connects neighbors and visitors of Indy to the history of the city and to have them feel a part of those stories. Powerfully Craig Rich, born and raised, studied in the line of Paris, teaching a new day. Our day to start started in the 25. People wanted all the style, did these come alive? Like geometry, same thing, just show design. Got to look at something about so just come alive. Got the concept is that there's a group of people who are in there. So I'm going to let you wa finish watching that video on our Vimeo page. So we have a lot of Vimeo uh, videos and I can't go through them all, but I wanted to introduce that hip hop writer to you. So we've done that in four different neighborhoods. Um, so it was through doing that work um, in someone else's neighborhood where we were adding, using the arts to add vitality with the pop-ups, where I began to realize that we had missed something. Um, the neighbors in that neighborhood were acting really nervous about our work there. And I didn't understand that because these were neighbors that owned their own homes. Um, they were, they had, they had either were retired or had good jobs, but they weren't going anywhere. Um, they weren't afraid of economic gentrification. They were afraid of cultural gentrification. And I had never understood that there was a difference and that there were two forms of gentrification before. And I, you know, economic gentrification is when Financially, you're pushed out of a neighborhood. Uh, your rent goes up or your taxes go up. But cultural gentrification is when your story is erased. And um, we see this happen when neighborhoods get new names and when new people move in and they think that they're the first people that have ever lived there and they completely ignore the stories that came before them. And so this is when we decided that our work with the arts uh, wasn't gonna be about strengthening neighborhoods and wasn't going to be about adding vitality to neighborhoods, but it was going to be about loving the neighborhoods, the neighbors that live there and elevating their stories. And so I'm going to show you our very first video um, that we did to do this. And it's called The Barbershop of Blessing. And the music is by Nabil, Nabil Entz. Some of you might know the Entz last name. <laughs> Big shout to them more. Big shout, Mr. Moore. Gotta let the people know. We're in the barber shop of blessing. Hit 
to meditate, here to celebrate black excellence, opulent, decadent, effortless, elegance, mindful intelligence, hall of fame, excellent, business up, excellent, just the other year, homie, guaranteed a Cadillac, never got to it, guess the Lord had to have him back, love is hard, love is so loyal to the day I'm old, never gotta take a break, never gotta break a bone, building all the brothers up, left a take, we be thinking better with the freshest cut, heaven's sake, I done made a mess now, should I have to clean it up, message for the children, always help clean it up, I done met a triple OG, how'd you make it out, never would've made it, and I'm wiser and I'm stronger now, let to tell the story, it's a blessing that you tell it, the people need to hear it, the barbershop a blessing, man, the barbershop a blessing. So once again, I'm stopping the video halfway through. I apologize for that, but you can watch the rest of that on our video page. So thinking about using art to know and love people, um, we started looking at the neighborhood just east of us. And that's, this is where Miss Shirley lives. And this is a neighborhood that um, had had a lot of challenges. There were a lot of vacant lots. Um, the interstate had gone through and it divided the neighborhood and it um, divided families and, and um and a community that had been very strong. And um, we could tell that because of its proximity to downtown, that the real estate developers were gonna be eyeing that neighborhood as the next place. Um, there were so many vacant lots available, they'd be able to go in and buy a lot of land inexpensively and build out really a new neighborhood. And we wondered if we could get out in front of them and if we could get a uh, partner with the neighborhood to use the power of art to know and love the neighborhood story so that it would not be erased and to know and love the neighborhood, the neighbors so that they wouldn't be um, pushed out. And so this, this neighborhood, um, uh, we, we didn't know how, we didn't really know what to do. And we didn't know what a neighborhood looked like that was strengthened, but not gentrified. We'd never seen that. We'd seen gentrified neighborhoods but we'd never seen a neighborhood that was healthy um, that, that wasn't gentrified. Um, and so we turned to theater to help. So we decided to create a theater event called Pre-Enact Indy. So all of you have heard of re, uh, reenactments. So you go see a civil war reenactment, people are acting out the past. We decided what would happen if we got to know the neighbor's hopes and dreams and partnered with theater and theater could act out a world that ought to be, could act out a world of justice and mercy, a place of heaven on earth. And so um, because we started doing theater, we needed a stage and we decided that the three block long commercial strip, most of it was, was vacant, was gonna be our stage. And that included every sidewalk, every lane of the, the street, every vacant lot and every, um, every building. It was all part of our three block stage. Um, we met in lots of different ways with neighbors, sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes um, talking to them in the grocery store and sometimes in gatherings uh, to learn their stories. And we've, we haven't stopped um, stories. We are continuing to learn stories and continuing to get to know our neighbors. And we took the neighbors' hopes and dreams and we partnered with 13 theater companies the first year. We've done this three years in a row. And this is kind of the crazy plan, you know, every... Uh, basically every lot had a different theater group attached and a different purpose and a different hope and dream or story that they being acted out by the, by the actors. So we're planning all this and then all of a sudden, um, we're six months away from our big outdoor theater event when a brand new gentrifying restaurant uh, announces that they're moving in. You can see the, uh, per the permits in the window there, um, they were coming. And at first my thought was, oh no, it's too late. Gentrification is already happening. It's too late. We just need to give up and it's, it's gonna happen. But then I realized that, that um, pre-enacting was needed more than ever. And so I went to this business and I said to them, um, you're building a new, a, a new business in a neighborhood that you're not from. You don't know the neighbors. How are you gonna love your neighbors? How are you going to be a blessing to them? And they kind of looked at me like I was crazy. Um, who is this woman asking us questions? We're a business, we're here to make money. But literally within 30 days, they called me back and they said, you know, we've been thinking about this and you're right. Um, in fact, we've just met with the Edna Martin Christian Center and they are a workforce development group that works with this neighborhood and we're gonna hire local. 
And so this was, these are the kinds of conversations that we started having with businesses as they were moving in. And every time it was uncomfortable at first, but every time they would end up responding um, and actually being thankful that we even took the time to ask them how they were gonna love their neighbors. So with a few gentrification scares, we kept going and we started training the artists and the students um, in the neighborhood about the history of the neighborhood. Um, and then the, the uh, set designers started building temporary buildings. We built 11 temporary buildings on the vacant lots and we activated the vacant storefronts. And then three days before our, our first, our big pre-enactment, all of a sudden I'm driving down the street and there is this mural being painted on a new pizza place that wasn't quite open, they were, but they were trying to make their place look nice before our big event. And they were painting, um, the, the painting of a white woman with blonde hair and blue eyes. And my heart sank because this is a historically African-American neighborhood. And in our pre-enactment, we are honoring the stories of people that came before us. And my fear was that the neighbor didn't, this new pizza company didn't realize that um, their art was actually uh, being interpreted to mean that um, African-Americans were not, this pizza place wasn't for them. And so I called the, the owner and I said, thank you for bringing art to the neighborhood. I think that's wonderful. I'm just wondering if you knew this is how people feel. And he said, oh my goodness, it's just art. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and I had to explain to him, art is really powerful and art does mean something. And we need to be very, very careful in how we use art. And so um, I need to, um, so, so I, I couldn't tell him he had to, it's not my property. I couldn't tell him he had to change the mural. But within two days, it looked like this. He had had a permit from the city. He wasn't really allowed to change much. Um, and so he darkened the skin a little. He changed the hair to blue. The name of the restaurant is Greek. So maybe this person's Greek. I don't know. But it was amazing to me that he, um, he was so eager to be told, um, to be asked to, or invited, I guess is the better word, into, into, into changing. And then he didn't stop there. The next summer, he built an addition. And when he built that addition, um, he did a new, mur new mural. And so we're just really grateful that um, we've been able to have these conversations with neighbors as they've moved in. And we've done this not just with the, um, the businesses, but a lot of the new residents as they've moved in. We've asked them, how are they going to love their neighbors? So the big day came and we, in our pre-enactment, one of the things we pre-enacted was um, a neighborhood that was engaged politically and engaged, um, cared about their, um, their future. And so our Congressman came from Washington DC and was a part of the pre-enactment talking about his plans for our community and students spoke and spoken word artists spoke as well. Um, one of the things the neighbors had complained about was the fact that people, it's a four lane street that people just speed on and no one walks on the sidewalks because it's such a dangerous speed. Uh, there's so dangerous with the cars driving so fast. So in pre-enacting the future where cars drove slowly, we got very creative and we decided to put a cafe right in the middle of the street. Can you imagine what this special event people, the committee, we had to go before to get permission to do this. They just thought we had lost it. But um, we convinced them that this was important to, uh, that we could invite cars to drive down two of the lanes and we could close to the lanes and um, that we could teach them to be respectful of, of people and not drive so fast in the neighborhood. Another thing we pre-enacted was basketball. The neighbors, one of the hopes and dreams was basketball on every street corner. And in many gentrified neighborhoods, there's no basketball. Um, people take down the hoops because it gathers young kids together and they don't want those people in their neighborhood. And so um, basketball became a part of our pre enactedy script. One of the things that just really struck me was walking people walk on the, on the sidewalk. This is a, a neighborhood where um, cars have taken over and have dr driven fast and people don't feel safe walking down the sidewalks. And so for a day, we were able to act out a world, a neighborhood that was safe and a neighborhood uh, where cars showed respect and, and neighbors could walk around their, their own sidewalks. Another thing that we did in our pre-enactment was we discovered um, this, this um, the Dunbar Branch Library, this door and the sign was actually covered with ivy and overgrown. And I wondered what it was. And um, I found out 
from um, Googling it that it was actually uh, an African-American library. It was a branch library where many Americans received their very first um, library card. And there was a lot of community and learning um, that happened there. And the current owner of the building had no idea that that was the historic use. And, and once they found out, they cleaned it up and they planted some flowers out there. And we were able to pre-enact, use that space to pre-enact. And we turned it for the day into a neighborhood history center. And we invited long-term residents in and students interviewed them and gathered their stories so that they could be uh, retained for the future. We turned on um, billboards that typically advertise McDonald's and under other unhealthy foods um, into billboards that celebrated the neighborhood. Um, and then because we've gotten to know so many of the long-term neighbors, um, we created portraits of them and hung them on the side of the empty buildings. And we call these portraits the Great Triarchs. And Miss Shirley, who's gonna to talk to you today is one of our Great Triarchs. And she is featured here in this red, the red polka dot, um, uh, painting. And um, the idea behind the great triarchs is not that these are necessarily, they would never say they're the greatest neighbors, um, but they help write the story of their neighborhood. And so we're honoring um, the work that they've done in their neighborhood and how they have welcomed other people into their short story. They've been very excited to share their stories with us. Um, some of our artists have gotten involved. One artist is a, loves making signs and he made sign, a sign saying, great history is worth preserving, contribute to great triarchy, which we turned into yard signs and posted around the community, which is kind of fun. And then um, we revitalized some neighborhood murals. Um, and then one of the things that was really fun, one of the pastors on the that strip of that business strip was the pastor of the True Victory Church of God in Christ. And it was his, he and his wife's 30th wedding anniversary that year. And so we turned, um, they had a vow renewal ceremony that everyone was invited to, and then cake and punch in a tent for, you know, 500 people. And then at the end of the day, um, after a lot of music and celebration, we ended the, our pre-enactment day at five o'clock with the, the pastor and his first lady getting in their limousine and driving across um, 16th Street kind of as the end of the day, which was really awesome. And now I'm gonna show you a video of that event. <clears throat> Somehow we've got to find a way to recognize how we got here today in order for us to understand where we ought to go. Yes in order for us to form new realities, to form new normals, to help create a neighborhood we've never seen before for our children and our children's children, for our children and our children's children. Hey, 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 you your daddy's son. 
grandson and your sister's sister. Okay, so that's our awesome pre neck video. Um, so you can see that we have really loved working and partnering with the neighborhood. Um, and we've learned so much ourselves about um, how as individuals, our hearts need to change um, for us to love our neighbors. It's not just about going in and, and um, using art to, to show your neighbors you love them, but it's actually about your heart um, being able to love people better. And um, so we've learned a lot about that. We've learned that we need to pre-enact, I need to pre-enact. I'm running around asking businesses to pre-enact, but I need to pre-enact too. I need to change my heart because our neighborhoods are never gonna be healthy um, until our hearts are changed. And so um, it's been great to be doing all this neighborhood work. And, and we've certainly learned a lot. We've gotten um, better and we've partnered well with Redeemer and their congregation has gotten involved in so many and almost all, every aspect of this. Um, so we were quite ready to keep going with this, all this good work we're doing. And then all of a sudden COVID happened, right? And we had to completely reinvent the way we loved our neighbors. And so now I'm gonna, um, my image here is one of our artists fighting the coronavirus. And I'm gonna run through some of the slides of what we've done during COVID. Um, so we start with loving our neighbors and, um, and who are our neighbors. Our neighbors are our, our neighbors that live near us. And they're all, our neighbors are also the artists that we serve. And so we decided that during COVID, we weren't gonna stop programming. Uh, we were going to pivot and do safe things. So an ex a small example would be that um, Redeemer um, members were looking for a way to um, love the community during COVID. And so um, for several weeks, um, they signed up to do meals for the great triarchs. And so um, that was one small way that, that we could program and to love our neighbors during COVID. But then thinking about artists, um, because our building was shut down for quite a while of COVID, we used that time, uh, it wasn't open to the public, so we used that time to make physical improvements to our building, and that included commissioning a lot of public art. So this is a karaoke elevator. We have a new elevator, but it's also a karaoke machine, and so we did this during COVID. Um, we also commissioned a human hamster wheel, and this is something that dogs and their owners and children can all run on. And, you know, we have a lot of neighbors that walk by the Harrison Center, so this is a way to welcome them. Instead of saying, stay off our property, welcome onto our property. Um, we built a rooftop deck, which give, gives us more outdoor space, open air, clean, fresh air space, and added LED tetherball. Uh, we had an extra staircase. What do you do when you have an extra staircase? Maybe add a slide. Um, you know, we're really into porching. I've talked about how we like to porch and we're gonna uh, talk more about that in a second, but we um, added sliding glass doors to our city gallery to make it a fresh air gallery and it added a front porch. So we, we commissioned our artists to do a lot of work and I'm gonna run through a few of the things we worked with on our artists. One was our social distance hoop walk. So we had this idea of, of giving kind of public service announcements, uh, performance art in neighborhoods where um, we would wear these social distance hoops, hoop skirts to show people how to walk six feet um, from each other. And walking in Indianapolis was allowed. We were allowed to go out and exercise. So we took advantage of that. And we uh, partnered with neighbors and, um, and artists um, so we walked in the neighborhood and then we, a um, couple months later, we added flowers. Uh, we were thinking about some of our great tracks that hadn't been able to plant flowers, go to the store and buy the flowers they normally would do. So we took flowers to them. And here's a little phone video. Um, and then... Then we, um, we also put lights on them and one evening and we went down to Monument Circle. And you can watch more of that later. Um, like every city, people were making masks. And so we, our artists joined and started um, sewing masks and delivering masks. And some artists just didn't want to do it the regular way. 
So she made a beard mask and a monster mask and a mask with a button so you could eat and um, all kinds of other crazy masks. Um, and it's interesting how all this art helped her work out some of her angst and helped the other artists work out some of their feelings of anxiety and using humor and using um, emotions to process what they were feeling. Um, then we delivered, we, we wanted to find ways to reach our neighbors in a safe way. So we made quarantine, bag, quarantine bags and we delivered 400 of them. And they had all kinds of crazy stuff in it. Uh, last year we had made centrifugation soap and that's the idea that gentrification stinks. You need to lather up in sweet community. You need centrifugation soap. So the idea is that this soap smells like Miss T's. Um, Miss T is one of our great tricks. Her grandmother used to make sweet potato pie and that smell would just waft through the neighborhood. And so one of the ways that we ask people to enter into the story of their neighborhood is to use all their senses that God has given them and smelling um, is a way to, to reach back into history and to learn about your story. Uh, we also provided maps of the neighborhood. Um, the neighborhood that uh, Miss Shirley at the Great Turks live in, uh, there've been different political uh, and real estate developments over different periods of time that have brought different names to the neighborhood. And so it was important to talk about what those names were and what and why they're important. And, um, and that and names or neighborhood names can be a pretty complicated issue. So we wanted to share that with the new neighbors as well. Um, we, we had uh, paper doll books that, that included artists and great triarchs that we delivered. Um, we gave them yarn so that they could, and a pattern to make um, petals. And then we did a knit graffiti project with the ones that were sent back. So that was, um, those were some of the ways that we reached out to our neighbors. Um, but we also, it was porch party time, you know, uh, COVID started in March and in May, we're usually kicking off our porch parties. And so we realized that we couldn't do porching the regular way and we had to reinvent it as social distance porching. So typically this is what my porch would look like. Um, people, I don't have a big porch, so people would be kind of sitting in real tight. Couldn't do that. Um, typically we would be advertising porch parties all over town and we had to be careful how we did that because we didn't want to be accused of causing people to gather. So we developed a campaign called social distance porching. And we invited our neighbors to go out onto their front steps or onto their stoop or onto the balcony or their front yard or their porch every day at five, get up behind, get up off their couch and get off behind their, la their laptop and go out and practice their hey neighbor wave. Simple as it is, practice your hey neighbor wave. My neighborhood did it actually from the beginning of May until the end of June. And it was a, a, about nine families did it. We um, advertised it on billboards around town we hired an artist to go all over the city and she documented 100 houses in different neighborhoods that were doing social distance porching, whether it was practicing um, music lessons on the porch or um, people that didn't really have a porch sitting on their front steps um, or sitting on the porch swing, lots of different ways to porch. Mm, I'll throw a party on my porch today. Everyone's So we did porching, which went, worked really well. And then we started doing a drive-in theater. So we're used to gathering people inside to share. We've created a lot of video over the years, um, but we couldn't do that. So we projected it on the side of a vacant building and we used um, a radio FM transmitter so people could listen to it from their car. Um, and here's an example of one of the, we showed 13 movies and this is a, a documentary about a motorcycle club. I joined the Rough Riders at age 19 in 1964. Earl Cantrell, but nobody would know me. I'm actually in the Rough Rider Dirty Red. There's car clubs, golf clubs and everything. We just like motorcycles. I think it's changed my life the most of 
meeting people and just getting along with them. It forms a brotherhood to where okay. it's actually one great big yeah. family that we're just like, we're all brothers. So um, you can watch more of that on our Vimeo. The next thing we did was um, our window walk. So we knew people were outside exercising. People were used to coming to us for a holiday window walk, but we added a COVID window walk and we paid our artists to decorate windows to help people process their emotions and what they were feeling during COVID. Later on, we did racial justice windows and now we're doing hope windows. Um, we were used to having first Fridays where we'd have a lot of people come. We couldn't do that. We had to have virtual first Fridays. We did that with the, the aid of the media. Um, one channel came for every first Friday and covered all the shows so that people could uh, kind of have a, have a video tour. And then we partnered with another channel to, um, we delivered paintings to uh, the broadcasters' homes and they were broadcasting from their homes. So they were able to hang the paintings in their houses and talk about the paintings while they were broadcasting. And this was so helpful to our artists who had lost their, their livelihood, their ability to make money during COVID. And then we added an online gallery. And if you go to our website, um, you can see that that's become a really important part of what we're doing now. And we're gonna continue after COVID of offering this on online gallery. And then we also did uh, both Redeemer and the Hair Center did some blood drives because we were allowed to open our galleries for blood drives. And that was a really important way of serving the community during COVID. Um, another fun thing that we did was, uh, I said we did a lot of public art. We restored our smokestack. And when we did that, we actually put um, a fog machine in the base in the base of it and lights in the top. Let me show you a little video. So we can actually have purple smoke or green smoke or yellow smoke. And um, that was kind of a fun project to do when you're trying to keep people safe, but find ways to be a spectacle of wonder. And um, I'm not using my backdrop, but we had a lot of fun with Zoom backdrops and um, I almost did it today, but then Miss Shirley wouldn't have been able to see it on my shoulder. So that's kind of my little summary. Um, I'm gonna now turn the screen, I'm gonna stop my share and I'm gonna turn my screen over to Miss Shirley, who's gonna speak about being a, a neighbor, um, what her neighborhood is, has been like and how she has felt like art can be used to know and love people and maybe what some of her favorite things were and what you should learn, what you should know. Hi, Joanna just gave a real great history about the Harrison Art Center and how it came forward to the point where <clears throat> I became involved at the pre and act part. I was invited to uh, some of that excitement that happened on our 60th Street corridor. From that point on, when they started asking us about community stories, well, I had done a lot of work in the neighborhoods. I think that's how my name came up in the first place. But once I was introduced to this, it was exciting because everybody knows I don't have a problem with talking. I love to talk. So when you invite me to do a story, well, that was great. But I found after I told my story, I had the opportunity to listen to so many of my neighbor's stories. There were so many of my neighbors I thought I knew. I really did not know their stories. That was exciting. It also opened up a window where we have been concerned in our neighborhood for ever. Uh, about having art in the community. In communities like ours, um, moderate income to low income, most of the things that are done, even programmatic uh, from the government down to the uh, grassroots, is usually about food, clothing, the necessary things. But sometimes I think we forget that those things are important, but the most important thing is not so much the outer person, but it's the inner individual. More than we need external things, 
we need that enlightenment and encouragement, that lift in spirit from things like art, uh, music. It's amazing to me how resilient the human family is. We can take a lot of stuff. We, we, we're fighters, we're resilient. And it doesn't really take a whole lot to encourage us and to keep us pretty much level as far as joy, even no matter what we're going through with art, music, those things that are usually absent from our type neighborhoods. So you can imagine how excited some of us were when the Harrison started doing their work. Porching, oh my God, that was something that we were so familiar with and we missed very much. Talking to each other over the fence, we had missed. So being introduced, although when we heard reenactment, well, we also found that Harrison is genius at reinventing words or inventing new words. We had no idea what that meant. But becoming a part of that, seeing our neighborhood as how we wanted it, as opposed to how it was, it became exciting and made us want to, <clears throat> pardon me, take part in making that happen. Um, it has really been interesting to me that the Redeemer Church somehow became a companion to the Harrison Arts Center. I've always felt our churches are so underused, especially today. We have some of these fabulous churches and especially in my neighborhood. And yet they are not utilized. There's space, there's certainly time because some of our churches are not open except maybe two or three days a week. So can you imagine if and incidentally, church is usually where people that have problems turn, especially my culture, the church, the pastor. Uh, these are kind of the places where you look up to for your hope. Can you imagine if we could incorporate these things within our religious body where we need to be more inviting in the first place, I think our churches got to be a little bit too closed. The COVID has, I think, given us that example. We can really, don't have to be in the building all the time. We need to be out where people are. Human beings, we need to be with nature. Art does that. Art's the beauty in nature. I don't think we get to see very much when we're struggling every day, trying to make ends meet, provide for our families. But when we do take out that time to do our spiritual duties of going to our churches and uh, be with, that's mostly where we meet. If we could have art there, that I can't imagine what that would do with the community because I think the problem we're having today and with the COVID we really found was true. We need to be with one another. Human beings are just made that way. When we don't, it causes a lot of depression and some other things, I'm sure. So has the Harrison Arts Center been a benefit to our neighborhood? Yes. We did have social issues. It also makes a difference there because by being able to be with your neighbors, you begin to communicate. That's where the planning begins. And all the plans that we have that's where we come together and it's strengthened when we come together as a community. And when we get together and begin to learn about each other, it makes us care about one another. The Harrison has introduced that back into our community, which we have missed for many, many years. It is wonderful to see people back on the streets interacting with one another. People are walking, believe it or not. I'm even excited about the interracial mixture I, I think we missed the point many times as to who we are specifically other than just human beings. And I think the more that we interact with one another, the more we understand one another, the more we know one another. 
then we learn that we're not so different after all. So I, I don't know what else that I can add today, except that I am excited about uh, the Harrison bringing this notion of porching back to us. And in turn, we are beginning to share that with the greater neighborhood. And I'm hoping it will catch on throughout the city. I'm sure it will. Uh, the COVID kind of set us back a little bit, but we also learned by these new little creative things that Harrison did, how we still could do some things to keep from being disconnected. As a senior in my community, we have been searching for ways to still stay connected. That there's just that br bridge there's between seniors and the rest of the world, I think at some point because of what happens with seniors specifically. But I find the arts has helped us to be able to do some of the things we'd like to do, share with one another, even though we can't get outside always, but by remembering one another, keeping in touch with one another, it has brought this back to the forefront. So I can only see that our neighborhood is excited. I know that the city is getting excited because we, even as a community being a part of this, the city is, has been a great part of being part of us. We're working together more, uh, I think, um, on a happier front. And that's what we needed. We know how to work hard. We know how to do what we need to do. But we need that joy that excitement about beauty uh, and actually being able to reach and touch it. And that's what our neighborhood is not. It is difficult for poor people to pay for piano lessons or to go abroad or to take their children to Florida and this kind of thing. Bringing the art into the community, it just works for everybody. Hopefully it will make for a better community. And of course that will make for better citizenry. I think that's as much as I can add right now. Um, Probably enough. Of that, no, that is awesome. I Miss Shirley should have done the first 45 minutes. She's amazing. I can listen to her again and again and again. So I'm going to look at the chat, uh, or I'm sorry, the Q&A. Um, Lee Williams said, this has been very inspirational. How is the Harrison Center funded? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I have to figure that out every week. <laughs> How are we funded? Yeah, we're, you know, we're a small nonprofit and we have to figure it out like everyone else. Um, we've tried to um, have diverse income streams. So um, we have about 50% of our income is earned and that's through selling art. We take 30% of sales of art in our gallery. Um, we, and we, um, we rent studios to artists. They don't pay very much. Most artists pay about $100 a month, um, but that is some income for us. Um, and then we do some consulting, um, just kind of telling our story and, and helping other people figure out how to do similar things. Um, and um, we have, yeah, we, have, we, we try to make about half of our money through earned income and then half through fundraising. And that's a combination of grants and individual uh, giving, but it's, it's something I have to figure out all the time. I, I wish we were a big established organization with an endowment that would be amazing, but we're not. So we're always trying to kind of be smart about it. Um, another question is how can a church start a ministry of this type? Atlanta has a huge art community. community. Um, so that if that is really something I'm passionate about, um, the Harrison Center is so much stronger because of its relationship with Redeemer and Redeemer is so much stronger because of its relationship with the Harrison Center. So I really believe that, um, that we serve as a really good model. And if you would love to like visit us, um, I'm sure we'll be open soon from COVID. Um, Indiana in general is fairly open. We're waiting on um, um, our, our mayor to open Marion County a little bit more, but but I'm sure by this summer that will be a safe place to visit. Yeah, and you come porch with me and, and Miss Shirley. Um, so we'd love to have you visit. Uh, planning a visit around a first Friday is a really smart idea because then you get to see what it's like 
um, all the activity here. And then you can um, visit the studios and just get a little bit more sense of, of what we do. Um, I would, it practically, if you, um, if you have people in your community that care about art and love their neighborhood, um, gathering together and just start brain, brainstorming would be a great first step. Um, and um, so, and somebody else, asked, the question was, what are some of the first steps for a church of love neighbors through art? Um, so to me, I have, I believe that the porching activity we do, I believe that's an art form. Um, everything from when I porch at my house, I use all these mismatched dishes that remind me of stories. You know, mm. this belonged to my grandmother, or this was made by an artist, or this was made by an uncle who wasn't a very good artist, but still makes me think nice thoughts about him, you know? So I have all these little dishes that I use and, um, and the, the type of food I serve and the type of what I serve. And if I put flowers or don't put flowers or whatever, to me, porching has become kind of an art form for me. And I think that's one of the easiest things and most helpful things to churches to start with getting their congregation excited about porching because all of us has, have been ruined in a sense by modernization. And I'm being really dramatic, but you know, TVs and air conditioning have taken us off our front porches. They've all pulled us inside our homes and attached garages, while I don't have one and I would probably love to have one, that prevents us from connecting to our neighbor um, because you can actually park in your garage and never even see your neighbor and privacy fences, same things. And so if I were you, I would get your community, your church community to commit to like my husband and I, we porch um, on Sundays from three to five 30. And we have about 12 people, six are usually regulars and six are, you know, miscellaneous guests. And, um, but that rhythm, that regular rhythm of porching um, allows us to get to know our neighbors and allows us to, to be hospitable. Um, so I would, I would really encourage you to do that. You don't have to have to have a front porch, the porch. You can have a front stoop. You can have a front yard. You can have a driveway. Um, but I would encourage you to try to be out countercultural, try to be out front, not in the back, if at all possible. That's how I would say to start. Um, I think that somebody else asked, how did you connect with the artists? Um, so initially, um, I didn't know any artists in town. I did not have an art background when the hair center started. And I only knew, I knew one artist, his name was Kyle Ragsdale. And he and I had worked on a fundraiser. Uh, we had decorated tables for a fundraiser together. And so I called him and all it takes is you, you, you just, you ask one person and they give you another person and it's any other kind of networking. So I started with him and, um, and then when we decided to open up the building and charge a hundred dollars, regardless of size, shape, or smell, which I think was a pretty good business plan. <laughs> um, we, you know, artists sniff out deals like that, right? They find you. And so, um, so I think the artists found us and the more we developed a relationship or a reputation for loving artists, um, the, the stronger we have become. I think that important thing it is uh, churches, often have a reputation for using artists. And I wanna say this very carefully. Um, you know, you have music, churches have musicians, churches have, they naturally have people in, in the arts and um, they're always asked, you know, to donate and do things for free. And that's what we do in a church community, you know, um, is we contribute. Um, but uh, sometimes artists who make their living doing art and are asked all the time to donate their art, that can be a real challenge. And so one of the things that Redeemer has done a really good job with is, um, is they've actually have a fund a, a separate from the Deacons Fund and they have a special fund where they help artists and they help hire artists to do things rather than always asking artists to do things for free. So that is one way to connect with artists and that's a way to love artists. Um, and it's a way that leads you to loving your neighbors if you kind of do it in that, that order, I think. Um, I'm gonna look and see if we have any other, um, any other questions. Um, 
So I think we have five minutes left and I don't see a question. So I might ask a question of, um, of Ms. Shirley. So Ms. Shirley, um, you were part of a devised theater project called Rashida's Freedom Day. And um, you, so a playwright came to town and worked with you and some of the great triarchs to learn your stories. And then you actually presented them. This is just before COVID started. You presented them, which was amazing. And now it's being turned into a movie. Yeah. What do you think of all that? And tell me what your experience was with Rashida's Freedom Day. Well, uh, first of all, I started to tell the stories. And we, of course, seniors, we, we're anxious to talk. That's why we get in trouble with schemes and stuff on the phone when we should answer. We love to talk. Uh, so telling the story was exciting. And it just went from one thing to another. It was amazing that people enjoyed it. And the artist was, the, but she was the, really the one. She put the work together. We just talked and she made it happen like it was really something. But um, I find there is a need for this kind of thing. It, I know we like movies, but most of the time, you know, we know that they're not real. I think sometimes it's really fresh air when we know something is true. And we found that telling those stories, particularly the one lady that the movie's named after, it was such a fascinating story to even the rest of us that were telling the stories. And that's just what happens when people start to talk and tell their stories. It's amazing what can happen, um, just given the opportunity and sharing. That's what could happen. Um, I am amazed. I think right now I've been um, featured on some shows such as yours. I'm in a movie star now. I've been a model now. Who would have thought it at 80 years old and over? <laughs> you know. So it's a wonderful thing just to get with people. Is that's what really happens when people get together and start doing something that's very positive, especially like loving your neighbor. Our loving people, period, loving others. Thank you, Ms. Shirley. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, we're all, we all try to figure out how to solve problems. Yeah. And um, for me, there's so much I don't know, but I do know that um, I've been called to love my neighbor. That's easy. I mean, that's, that's, it's, and so to, I mean, I'm not gonna say it's easy. It's sometimes hard to love your neighbor, um, but it's my, it is my direct calling to love my neighbor. There's no question about the fact that I've been called to love my neighbor. And so what a joy it is to use my resources and, and help inspire the artists to use their resources to create a movement of people loving their neighbors. And because um, that's that's the only way that we're going to have neighborhoods that are healthy, without people being pushed out. Um, so anybody who comes to Indianapolis, we'd love to porch with you, and we'd love to show you the Harrison Center. Uh, my email address is jtaft at harrisoncenter.org. Feel free to reach out um, and look at our Vimeo page. There's so many fun videos and. Um, we we're just really thankful that we've had the opportunity to share our stories with you today um, and would love to stay in touch. Um, and let me just see if there's any other last questions. Um, I think it, I just appreciate your positive feedback and um, it's an encouragement to us as, as we share. Thank you. Thank you. Joanna and Ms. Um, Shirley, I just wanna thank you so much um, I especially appreciate the um, art community. Uh, my father was an artist before it was popular for African-Americans to be in art. And I remember the struggle that he had um, going through that. But to see how you embrace that now in the communities, much like the community I grew up in, um, it's just, a very, it's a blessing to me to know that in order to really let others see the face of Christ, 
it means we have to let others see the face of Christ at work through us and through such a creative and different way. So this um, webcast was very special to me and the work that you all are doing is very special. And yes, when it is time where we can travel through on my way to Wisconsin, I will be stopping to see my family and you and Miss Shirley so that I can just sit at your feet and hear more about it. But we just really want to thank you for coming today and sharing this with us. Because as I said, Atlanta has such a large art community and we know so many other cities that do where there are PCA presence, but this is something that maybe has not been thought about, or maybe we thought about it and thought, how do we make that happen? So I want to thank you also for making yourself available as a resource, both of you, for people to reach out to and say, you know, hey, this is something God has laid on our church's heart. How can we do this? So I thank you for that. I thank my audience for joining us today. And I ask you, if you truly are interested in arts in your community, please reach out. We will share with you the email address for um, Miss Joanna and Miss Shirley so that you can reach them. And I ask you to join us next week for our MA weekly webcast. And we're going to close out in a word of prayer for Miss Shirley and Miss Joanna and the Harrison Center and just ask that God would bless them and continue to use them. So let us do that now, please. Most kind and gracious Father, I just thank you for Joanna and Miss Shirley. I thank you, Lord, for their willingness, Father, to take time out of their schedule to be able to share this wonderful, awesome ministry with um, those of us in the audience. I pray, Father God, that there is just one person in the audience, Father God, who has been challenged, who has, their heart has just been tugged at to reach out to Miss Joanna and Miss Shirley, Father God, to learn how they can use art to get to know their neighbors, Father God. And at the same time, getting to know your neighbors, Father God, you're letting your neighbors see the face of Christ and you're getting to know one another as we are children of the King. So Father, I thank you for them, Father God. I ask you, you would continue to bless their ministry. I would ask you, Father God, to continue to bless them with creative ways to gather together, Father God. Um, even as we're nearing the end of the pandemic, I pray, Father, that you would just bless their ministry financially, Father God. And Lord, that you would just continue to use them to be such a beacon in the community. And Father, I ask all this in your name. Amen. Thank you everyone for joining Thank us. You. Have a great day. Bye-bye.